Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Um, Friday morning. Oh, sorry. It's Thursday morning. And I don't know what is going to happen, but Jesus is big. Amen. Um, <laughs> God is going to help us. I want to say a very big thank you to Pastor Glenn. Um, I was thinking about how my journey has been for the past 18 years, ever since I walked through the doors of our fellowship. And this year marks 10 years exactly when I first came to conference. A few of you know about the story. I came to church about 18 years ago. For the first eight years, nothing will get me to come to conference. But exactly 10 years ago, in 2014, I came in here, and that is where God put his fire in my heart to go out there and obey him and do his will. So I want to say a very big thank you to Pastor Glenn for his faithfulness to continue to do this, and my life has been transformed as a result of that. Amen. So this morning, I want to preach a simple sermon of entitled, Set Me on Fire. Amen. Set Me on Fire. I believe my life was set on fire 10 years ago, and I believe God's grace is sufficient to set somebody's heart on fire today. Let's read um, from our text this morning, Malachi chapter 3, Malachi chapter 3, reading from verse 1 to 3, Malachi 3, 1 to 3. The Bible says, sorry, I've got a problem with my eye, but God will help us. Behold, I send my messengers. And he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you speak will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant. In whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he's like a refiner's fire and a laundress soap. Verse 3 says, He will sit as a refiner and purify silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering of in righteousness. Let's pray. Father, this morning, we pray, God, you minister your word in our, to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Set me on fire. It's natural that you get in a, or you are in a place and all of a sudden you begin to smell smoke. Or you look at a distance and you see some flames being lighted at a distance. And probably you may also begin to feel some heat around. Now when you, your senses um, captured any of these happenings, one of the common instincts for all of us to do is to run. All right? So um, this is just an illustration. There's not going to be fire over here. Amen. Let's say we are here and all of a sudden we see smoke coming from that side and then you see flames following, and then the place begins to get hot. What are you going to do? Run, right? It seems to be the natural thing that we all do. I came across this YouTube video. I'm sure some of you have seen it. Where there was this tanker that was moving from one place to the other. It fell by the roadside. And it was amazing how people, seeing such a deadly thing, decided to take their buckets and gallons to go and fetch gasoline. I mean, did you see that? And whilst they were fetching, the whole thing caught fire and people got burned right in, 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 um, in, uh, um, right before the, the, the cameras. About 10 years ago, I was living in my brother's house and I had put up the house for him. I supervised the building of the, the structure. We paid the electrician to do a lot of money 
to do the work, but what he did is that he used inferior materials to do the electrical works. And two years after the construction, whilst I was living there with my family, the place caught fire. We're in the story building. I was living up there. My family were, were, was there. And as soon as the fire started, what I could do, the only thing I, I could think about is just evacuate my family. And I went back in there to try to do what I can do to salvage the situation. But you know the fire service we have in Africa. They only arrive when the place is burned down. All right? That is, that is something that we just have to accept. But that is a natural instinct that all of us have to... Um, it's, it's our normal re response when... We see fire, the normal instinct is to run. It is natural that when our senses pick these signals, we run. But you see, there's another kind of fire when we begin to see it, we don't have to run from it. There is a fire which has God in that fire. And once we see that fire, the instinct that we and I need to have is to run towards that fire. We don't need to run away from that fire. Exodus chapter 3 verse 3, and listen, my message has been preached throughout the week. So, let's say I'm summarizing everything. Amen. Amen. Exodus chapter 3 verse 3, the Bible says, And then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. This is what the Bible says, that Moses moved towards the fire. Moses saw that the bush was burning, but uh, the bush was in flames, but it was not burning. He could see these signs, these things that our senses can pick up, but some way, somehow, it wasn't burning. And the Bible says that Moses did the right thing by moving close to that fire. This morning, what I'm here to encourage all of us is that we need to pray that God will set us on fire. That we move towards the fire of the Holy Spirit and not move away from it. You and I need to pray that God, we want our heart to be set on fire. That when we see the fire of the Holy Spirit burning, we don't run away from it, but we move towards the fire of the Holy Spirit. You know, we all cry that God burn in me. We sing that song, burn in me, burn in me, let the fire of the Holy Spirit burn in me, something like that. But so we pray that God, let your fire burn in me. But when the fire of the Holy Spirit is about burning in us, what we do is we begin to run away from it. We don't want the power of the Holy Spirit to have its full right in our lives. And there are several reasons why we normally run away from the Holy Spirit's fire. One of the things that I can think about is that we don't want to do what the Holy Spirit wants us to do. Because when we allow the Holy Spirit to have its way in our lives, we know that he's going to make us move in certain directions that our natural self doesn't want to go. Or sometimes we may look silly. Oh, amen. Amen. Sometimes when we allow the Holy Spirit to have his right of way, we think that, God, I'm going to look silly. I'm not comfortable standing on the, on the streets and preaching. I'm not comfortable going out there and loving people, following up on people. People can be trouble. Amen. That if the Holy Spirit is burning on you and I, and you and I have to go out there and do the will of the Father, we have to move out of our comfort zone. And that is something that you and I, we are not comfortable with. But we say that, God, we want your Holy Spirit to burn in us. But the resultant effect of the Holy Spirit burning in us, we don't want it. And that is what you and I do. We run away even though we speak and say, God, I need the Holy Spirit to be, to be in me. You see, the truth of the matter is that if the Holy Spirit is burning in us, yes, we may look silly. In the eyes of the world, everything that we are doing may look very, very silly. Everything that we begin to stand for may look very, very silly. But I'm here to let you know that it is better for me to be silly in the eyes of the world and to be good before, before God. Amen. That if the world thinks that I'm silly and Jesus says that I am good, that is all that matters. The other day I was, last week I was in the UK and I was having a conversation with this brother. And he was like, listen, I've seen you come to this UK conference from 2017 almost every year, save COVID. And there's something I've observed about you. There's, I've heard so many things about you, all the things that you do and all that, but you seem to be so humble. I'm like, listen, if God has made you feel and look so silly so many times, you don't have a choice than to be humble. Amen. If God will take you through so many things and God will embarrass you in so many situations, listen, you walk in this life and you have to be humble. Because you don't know the moment that God is going to pull the trigger and say, listen, there goes my son again, the foolish one. <laughs> And God has done this so many times in my life that, listen, anytime I get to stand, anytime I find myself, I'm like, God, I know it is not me and I need you, to, Lord, to do your will in my life. 
Listen, when God wants to move inside of you, you and I need to be prepared to not to wrestle. And yesterday, Pastor John preached about we wrestling with the Spirit of God. When God put his call upon your life, sometimes we wrestle because we are control freaks. Oh, amen. We want to be in control of everything that is happening. I want to be in charge. I want to be able to know the outcome of what is going to happen. I don't want to be out of control. None of us want to be out of control. And because we always want to be in control, when the Holy Spirit comes into our life and the Holy Spirit says that I want to be in control, there's a wrestle. That God, I don't want to leave everything in your hands because I'm not so sure how it's going to be. But God says, that, listen, that is how it's going to be. Allow me to take over your life and it's going to be good. Amen. Yesterday, Pastor Charles preached a very powerful message about the journey. That if you and I allow the Holy Spirit to work through us, he's going to take us on a journey. And by the time we, uh, we come to the end of that journey, we will know that, listen, God is good. Amen. We will know that the power of God has really, really, really moved. And that is the testimony that I have personally experienced 10 years, 10 years down the line. Ever since I said yes. Listen, the only reason why I'm preaching this sermon, listen, I had different thoughts. But the only reason why I'm preaching this sermon, 10 years on, I sat in these pews. We used to be here facing this way. And whilst I was there, sermon after sermon, I felt that God has set me up. I felt that they have brought me into this conference for every preacher to come and tell me how useless I'm being in my life. That I need to go out there and be useful for God. Amen. And that fire was set inside of me that day that I had to, I think it was on Tuesday morning after the morning seminar, I went to my pastor, Pastor Simeon, and said, Pastor, I'm ready. He said, you are ready for what? I'm like, everything you've been talking about for the past eight years, I'm ready. <laughs> but the fire of the Holy Spirit burned so much in me that I had to say yes. The only reason why he said he didn't send me out is that that year I didn't bring my wife. And so he couldn't send me out alone. But listen, I'm so grateful that I said yes to God because what God has done in these 10 years for me blows my mind. Everything that I thought my life was going to be about, God has just turned it up, upside down. Listen, God can be trusted. And this morning, all I'm trying to tell you is that if you send the spirit, the Holy Spirit fire burning, run into it, don't run away from it. Amen. See, instead of running away from the Holy Spirit, from his plan and from his purpose for our lives, we need to start running towards those flames. We need to ask God, God that God, you set me on fire. Probably we've been following God, we've been faithful to God, we've been doing the will of God for some time. But it seems the fires have gone down. But this morning, God is telling you and I that or you and I want to pray that, God, I need you to rekindle the fire inside of me one more time. It's one thing that fire does, or two things that fire does. It fire melts, destroys, and also it strengthens. Amen. Fire will melt and destroy all impurities. And at the same time, fire has the capacity to strengthen metals. See, the Holy Spirit wants to do these things in our lives. One man said this. See, the reason why God shows his people the vision and does not show them the plan is that if God should show them the plan, they are not going to obey God. God will show you the vision and God, after showing the vision, he will have to take you and I through some fires. And if God will show you and I the fire, we will say, God, there's no way I'm going to run into this fire. The case in point about Abraham. Abraham heard the voice of God, move out of your country and go into the land that I'm going to show you. Abraham had no clue where God was sending him. If Abraham knew that God was going to at a point tell him that, listen, the son that I'm giving you, you're going to offer that son, I don't think Abraham would have run into that fire. I don't believe that Abraham would have run into that fire if Abraham knew that he was going to be put in complex decisions where he may have to tell lies. Oh, Amen. I don't believe Abraham knew that there were all these battles that he had to fight. If Abraham knew those things, it's probable that Abraham may not have run into that fire. Think about Moses. God called him out of the wilderness when he was in Midian for 40 years. And if, if Moses knew very well that he was going to have this strong opposition from his own people, he was going to have this strong opposition from Pharaoh he was going to have these problems, these complex problems. If he knew the full magnitude of the problem, it's possible Moses would not have answered the call. The same with Joseph. If Joseph, after he had the dream, 
knew that everything that comes with a dream for that 13 years that he was going to be in this mess. If he had a full picture, I think he would have said, God, I'm going to sleep out again. And when I sleep, take this dream away from me. Listen, God will not show us the, the full plan, but God will show us the vision. And that is the fire that is burning. God wants you and I to run into that fire. And once you and I get the courage to run into that fire, God is going to do great things. Listen, I said two things about what the fire does. It burns impurities and it strengthens the metals. In Malachi 3 verse 3, and this is what really caught my attention. Just one phrase in that text. In verse 3, the Bible says, and he will sit as a refiner's fire. The Bible says that the refiner will sit and be watching what is happening in the crucible. He will sit down and be watching what he's put in that crucible and see how the fire is burning everything that's in there. That is in there. And you see, what is interesting is that the refiner doesn't take his eyes off what is happening in the crucible. And most of the time, we think that God takes his eyes off us. We think that when we run into the fire, God leaves us alone for, for us to burn and for us to turn into ashes. God says no. The Bible says he sits down and observes whatever is happening in the crucible. And most of the time, we think that we are going to be destroyed. You see, we are going to be melted, yes. Gold will be melted. Silver will be melt melted. And the melting process is God making you and I malleable. It's God making you and I humble. God making you and I useful. Because if gold is in its original shape, you cannot use it to do all these designs that you want. So God has to melt you up. And that fire that melts you up is what you and I need in our lives. But there are impurities that is also going to come out of our lives. And whilst those things are being melted, when, whilst we are being melted, those impurities are coming out of our lives. And the Bible says he's sitting down. And it's, we are being melted. And, and whilst we are being melted, the impurities begin to come into the surface. And once they come into the surface, the Bible says he carefully scoops that impurities and throws it off. How many of us are thankful that God takes those impurities out of our lives? And that is what God does with us. When we run into the fire, whilst we are being melted, God is moving these impurities out of our lives. See, 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13 says, He will not bring any temptation that is beyond you and I. For everything that you and I have to go through, for everything that you and I have to endure, you and I need to know that God will not get us to a place where we are going to be destroyed. No. God will ensure that you and I are protected. Someone will say, Pastor, yes, I've seen God move some impurities out of my life. And I believe God has removed impurities out of all of our lives. But yes, we say that God, even though you've removed some of the impurities out of our lives, I still do have some impurities there. How many of us know that? That we are not perfect. The only way we attain perfection is when we, be, we become the perfect image of God. Because that's what the Bible says, or that's what we know that the refiner does. When the refiner sees his image, the explicit image of himself in the crucible, that is when he knows that the, the material is fully ready. Amen. Until we see the full image of God in our lives, there's still some scooping that needs to be done. And you and I have to stay in that fire. You see, I, I just imagine how the, the refiner is sitting down and he's turning the the heat on. And whilst he's turning the heat on, you and I, we are screaming, oh God, this fire is going to kill me. He says, no, no, it's not going to kill you. I'm just giving you the right amount of heat to bring these impurities out. And once the impurities are on the surface, I'm going to scoop it out of your life. Listen, God will not destroy you and I. The heat will melt and destroy the impurities. But you and I, our lives will be preserved. Listen, don't be discouraged when you feel that you are going through some heat. And don't run away from it. Secondly, what it does is that it toughens up. up. I did a little bit of chemistry. And one of the things that you do when you are trying to strengthen a metal like steel. And when the metal like steel, you are increasing its strength. You call it increasing its tensile strength. So one of the things you do to increase the tensile strength of a metal is that you combine it with other strong materials. So when you put iron in this crucible and you are heating it up and you add products like carbon, once you add products like carbon, it increases its tensile strength. And that is what God is saying that I'm going to do with your life. 
I'm going to strengthen your faith. God is going to toughen your, your faith. God is going to ensure that he puts perseverance, he puts endurance, he puts patience to increase your tensile strength. Because there are so many things that God is, wants to do with our lives. There is a vision that God has put before us that you and I have to run towards. But we need a solid tensile strength. Metals with solid tensile strength are the ones that are able to withhold big edifices. So when you go and see a nice story building somewhere in the West or even here in Africa, you know that the materials they've used have a strong tensile strength. The amount of things that you and I will be able to carry as a, as a result or as a function of the, the tensile strength that you and I have. And so God says that when I'm putting these things in your life, I am... Increasing your tensile strength. James chapter 1 verse 2. James 1 2 says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith endures patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. God says that let all these things that I'm going to put in your life, let it have its right of way. And once it has completed its work, you are going to become that perfect thing that God wants you and I to be useful for his kingdom. Listen, God wants to do great things in our cities. God wants to do great things in West Africa. God wants to do great things in Africa. God wants to do great things all over the world. And we are the people that God says he's going to use us to do that. And if God doesn't put us in the state where we are ready to be able to do these things, there is no way. We'll go, we'll go out and we'll fa- we're going to fail. And that is why God says that I'm going to put stuff inside of you and I that when we go out there, we will be strong and we'll be able to withstand it. The theme for our conference is boldness without hindrance. If you and I are going to be bold and there's not going to be any hindrance for us to achieve the work of God in our days, God will have to take us through some stuff. And once you and I have gotten those things in us, I can tell you that we are going to take the nations for the Lord. Amen. Amen. We admire and respect our leaders. And listen, our leaders have gone through a lot. Amen. Our leaders have seen so much. And the things that they've seen, the things they've endured, the problems and the challenges that they've endured is what makes them so admirable. If they don't go through those things, they will not be able to do things and take certain decisions that has helped and guided us all these 55 years. The longer they stay in the will of God, the longer they do the will of God, the more God exposes them to great and mighty things. And that is why we admire them. We admire the anointing upon their lives, but the anointing is as a result of the things that they've gone through, the fires that they've run into. It's if we want the fires, but we don't want to run into these fires. And God is saying here this morning that this is the time that he wants you and I to run into those fires. Because once we run into those fires, he himself is going to ensure that we come out very good. And he's talking about leaders. Uh, last year, Pastor Stevens came to Ghana and had the privilege of having conversations with him. And it's, it's amazing the wealth of experience he's had, some of the challenges that he's had. Listening to him, and it's like, it's amazing. This man has endured stuff. Later, last part, um, the last part of last year, Pastor Brown came through. He went to visit Pastor Mponsa in Kumasi, and when he came, uh, took some of uh, the men to go and have a conversation with him. And you realize that these men have gone through stuff. Last week, I was having a conversation with my pastor, Pastor Fred Ruby, after I finished preaching at the South London Church, and I'm talking to him at, at, at lunch, and I'm asking him, Pastor, how have you made it all these years? And it's like, it hasn't been easy. He was recounting a story where he first took his, the first church he took over. The pastor was <laughs> gay. The pastor who had left the place turned out to be a gay. And he went into the place. And now there was so much. And it was, I mean, he was recounting how he was crushed because of the mess that had gone before him. And now he has to come in there. And now dealing with the things that he had to, it really strengthened. He said, no, no, it messed up my mind. Now, this is a man that has been saved for about 40 years. Doing the will of God for at least not, not less than 35 years. And you realize that they've gone through stuff that has crushed them, stuff that has strengthened them. 
Listen, the fires that you and I are running away from, God says, is the same fires that he's going to use to build his work in your life and my life. And you and I don't have to run away from the fires. This morning, you and I want to say, God, set me on fire, and I want to run into the fire. Listen, I'm here to encourage pastors. I'm here to encourage pastors' wives. I'm here to encourage disciples, members of our congregations. When the fires are coming, don't run. Run into it. Don't run away from it. Run into it because it's whilst we are running into this fire, that is when God is going to build the tensile strength in our lives. Do not be afraid of the fire. And the reason why you and I shouldn't be afraid of the fire is because Jesus is in the fire. Once Jesus is in the fire, you and I should know that, listen, everything is going to turn out good. We may not understand the full dynamics of it. We may not understand the process. But once Jesus is in that fire, you and I know that it's going to end very well. Amen. I want to begin to close. Begin to close. As I begin to close, I want us to consider the three, at least three blessings of the fire. The first thing I want you and I to understand is that the fire directs you and I. In the text in Exodus chapter 3, the Bible says that Moses went and saw, and this morning, I mean, Pastor Stevens just quoted the text. I'm like, I'm done. <laughs> in Exodus chapter 3, the Bible says that Moses saw this amazing thing and he went to the fire. And whilst he was engaging God, you know the story about God telling him to remove his sandals and all that. Whilst he was close to the fire, the Bible said that is when God started giving him directions. That's when God started telling him that you need to move to Egypt. That's why God was telling him, this is what I want to do with your life. These are the people and this is how I want you to go through it. Listen, once you stay in the fire of God, God is going to direct you and I. And that is why it's important that you and I stay in God. That you and I receive directions from God through the fire. Once you are in the fire and you remain humble... Once you're in the fire and you remain resolute before God, it's like, God, I need you to direct me every step of the way. Listen, God is going to give you direction. God is calling people today. Now listen, I need you to move out of where you are comfortable with because I want to direct you into a new course. That is what happened to me 10 years ago when I was in this, sitting in this conference. God was turning my life into a new direction. God was moving my path into a new direction, and I had to respond. That very day when, I mean, the second day of conference, I had to respond. I went straight to my pastor and said, listen, pastor, I'm ready. And I believe that, listen, this week has been so powerful, powerful preaching. And I don't want you to leave this place and not talk to your pastor. Because when I made that decision, when the fire burned in my heart, and I went straight to talk to my pastor. That decision-making point is what turned the course. If I had waited till I go back to Ghana and rationalize and think about it and all that, I may have lost the fire. And that is why it's important. Once the fire is burning, immediately begin to take decisions. Now! Last week, as I mentioned, I was in South London, and something interesting happened. On the Friday um, of the conference, powerful preaching, Pastor Greg Mitchell preaching, Pastor Alvin Smith, all these other preachers. And on the Friday, no, on the Friday night, I announced people who were being, going to different, different cities. And something interesting happened. One of the guys who was mentioned didn't come prepared. <laughs> he just came to conference. He was just dressed down, some straight dress and all that. Came with his wife sitting there. And whilst preaching was going on, the fire of God was burning in his heart. He just went up and went to speak with his pastor, Pastor Joe Gunya. I said, Pastor, I'm ready to do this. Pastor knew that he has been ready, but listen, he's not responding. So immediately when the fire was burning, he went to his pastor and so told Pastor, listen, I'm ready. If it can be done, let's do it tonight. Because he wasn't well, I mean, properly dressed, he wasn't suited. His pastor told him, go and talk to Pastor Fred. He's the leader of the conference, he's the leader of the body. Go and talk to him. If he's okay with him, we are doing it tonight. He went to talk to Pastor Fred, and yes, they sent that guy out right there in the conference on Friday night. He didn't come suited. When you look at the pictures, he's there. The guy is just wearing this white, straight dress. I mean, everybody on stage was in suit. But the fire was burning in the guy's life that he had to make a decision there. And that is why I'm here to let you know. Now, listen, don't wait for the fire to quench. If the fire quenches, you are going to rationalize it and it's not going to be good. Make them move now and God is going to do awesome things in your life. You see, 
Moses had stayed in Jethro's house for 40 years. He had become so comfortable. He had become so comfortable in Jethro's house, but the day he saw the fire, he moved close. God directed him in a new path. Are you comfortable in your Jethro's house? You are comfortable. You are getting free food. Everything is being provided. Amala, amala. Eba, eba. Egusi. Everything is cool right there. But God is saying, that no, it is time for you to move out of that comfort zone because there's something I want you to do. Moses is in Jethro's house for 40 years and the fire of God started burning and the Bible says he moved and God directed him. And that is what you and I need to do. We need to say, God, I hear you calling me this week and I'm, res- I'm going to respond to your fire that is burning in my heart. The second thing you and I need to know about the fire of God, the Bible says, the, we know that the fire of God delivers and protects. The fire of God delivers and protects. You see, God's holy fire directs us It also delivers and protects us from the enemy's harm against our lives. Isaiah chapter 43 verse 2 says something in the the second part. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor the flame scorch you. You know, my mind thinks about the three Hebrew boys. The Bible says that these men had been captured because they decided to do civil disobedience. They weren't ready to bow to anybody except God. And you know the story, they were thrown into the fire. But whilst they were in the fire, the Bible says Jesus, or the fourth man came in there. You see, this, this is what I caught. The enemy can set the fire. The fire was ne- Nebuchadnezzar's fire. It wasn't the three Hebrew boys' fire. It wasn't God's fire. It was the enemy's fire. But you see, as soon as Jesus entered that fire, it became the fire of Christ. As soon as Jesus entered the fire, the dynamics changed and it became the fire of God and the guys were protected. Listen, you, need, you and I need to stay in the fire of God because in the fire of God, protection is there. You and I think that when we answer the call of God, we are, our lives are going to be destroyed. No, your life is not going to be destroyed. God is rather going to protect your family. God is rather going to ensure that everything that concerns your life is ordered. Because in the fire of God, real protection is found. The three Hebrew boys were protected because Jesus was in the fire. Is Jesus in your fire? That's the question I want to ask to you you, you, this morning. Is Jesus in your fire? Or you are lighting your own fire and doing your own thing? Is Jesus in your fire? And you and I need to pray that God, I need you to set me on fire. I need the fire of the Holy Spirit to burn in me. God's Holy Spirit fire. His Holy Spirit protect us. You see, when you read the account of the book of Exodus, the Bible says that when the people of God were moving from Egypt to the promised land, you know about the story of the cloud of pillar and the cloud of fire, right? Those were the two that were guiding them. And the Bible says these people were moving and this was their protection. This is what God was using to protect them. The fire of God was part of the protective apparatus of God. And in Exodus chapter 14, verse 24, something interesting that happened. Let's read it. Exodus chapter 24, Exodus 14, 24. Now it came to pass in the morning, in the morning watch, that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through what? The pillar of fire in the cloud. And he troubled the army of the Egyptians. You see, God had to make sure that he's looking down through what? The fire. So if the fire is the one that is protecting you, if the fire is the one that is encompassing around you, is the one that is guiding you, God is going to protect you. God is going to defend you. The enemies will, will not be able to harm you. Because God looked through the fire that he has set and made sure that he protected the people. Listen, you and I need to be under the fire of God because that is where protection is. God is going to trouble the troubles which trouble you. (laughs) Amen. That's what God did to the Egyptians. The Egyptians were troubling the God's people. And God brought trouble to the trouble that was troubling his people. And that's what God wants to do for you and I. Finally, the fire of God will empower you. You see, we as believers, the reason why we've been engrafted into the household of Israel is because of Jesus Christ. Amen. That Jesus has saved us. And the Bible says he died and resurrected. And when he's resurrected, the Bible says he released the power of the Holy Spirit and it fell upon all of us. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, 
The Bible says that you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you shall be my witness in Jerusalem, in Judea, and in Samaria. It's Judea, Samaria, and to the outermost part of the earth. You see, the Bible says on the day of Pentecost, in Acts chapter 2, this is what happened in verse 2. Suddenly there came sound from heaven and a rushing mighty wind and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them dividing tongues of what? Fire. It appeared that there appeared dividing tongues of fire. And the Bible says when these tongues of fire came upon them, now these guys who were running away from the tyranny of the rulers, we were emboldened. They now went out there and they were boldly preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fire of God has now fall, fallen upon them. The tongues of fire, each person had their own tongue of fire. Last week, Pastor Alvin Smith made that powerful illustration. I mean, I've never seen it before, but it's like, when the fire came, everyone had their own fire. The tongues of fire was sitting on everyone. God is going to take you through your own fire. Your sister's fire is going to be very different from your fire because God is going to put you in a unique fire and that fire is designed purely for you. And once you walk in that fire, God is going to ensure that the empowerment that is supposed to come in your life will be yours. These were a bunch of fearful people. These were a bunch of people who could never imagine any good thing coming out of their lives. But when the fire of the Holy Spirit fell upon them, the Bible says these guys were empowered to do what they had to do. Listen, my question to you is, are you struggling with allowing the Holy Spirit to have its right of way in your life? Are you struggling? Are you wrestling? Are you pushing back what God wants to do in your life? My encouragement to you this morning is that don't leave this conference and not respond to God. You've been making the biggest mistake of your life. Respond to God, your life will never be the same. I close with a story. I, had, I read a story a couple of years back, and I think you may have heard about it. But let me just re reiterate it for the purpose of this sermon. But it's about this man who was in his house, just like my fire. My house was gutted with fire. They were in this house, and his son, and they were up there, and the fire gutted the place. And they were able to rush out, and they forgot about the son. The son was stuck up there. And whilst they were looking around, seeing what was going to happen, waiting for the proper fire service to come. <laughs> they now remember that the boy was up there. So the father signaled to the, guy, the boy to go up the roof. And while the boy was up the roof, the father, the father could see him from where he was standing and was screaming to the boy, jump down, jump, and I'm going to catch you. The son was confused. The son was up there and the son was like, I can't see anything. All I can see is smoke. Because smoke has gathered all over all of the place. And I can't see. If I jump, I'm, I think I'm going to fall. And the father was sitting, standing down there. Listen, I can see you. I can see you just jump. When you jump, I'm going to catch you. The boy jumped and truly the father catched him. Listen, this is what God is saying. The fire may be burning. You may not see the end. You may not see God at the end of it. And everything you see is smoke. Everything you see is the heat. But God says that if you jump through the fire... And by, by the time you land, you will find me catching you. You will land safely. You will land safely. Listen, my encouragement to you this morning. Don't let the fears of this life. Don't let the indecision. Don't let these things that you and I worry about. You know my story. I don't want to belabor the point. I mean, sometimes I don't want to repeat myself. But I struggled. I struggled. And that is why for me today, this yeah, it's my 10th anniversary. In my 10th anniversary, I want everyone to understand that, listen, respond to the Holy Spirit whilst he's speaking. Because when you jump, he's going to catch you. That's all I have for you this morning. Hallelujah. Amen. May the Lord set us on fire again in Jesus' name. After listening to 14 sermons, I just wonder what else I'm going to preach. But I believe God is going to take dominion. God is going to take control this morning. Hallelujah. I want to thank Pastor Glenn and the conference body for the privilege given to me to minister this morning. 
And I really want to appreciate every one of you that have attended this conference. And I pray that the purpose of your coming today or this week would not be forfeited in Jesus' name. Now, if you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of Luke chapter 9 this morning. Luke chapter 9. And um, I would like to begin with the word of um, A.W. Toza that says, The Christian life must be a life that is lived in continual state of unbroken worship. Say it again. The Christian life must be a life that is lived in continual state of unbroken worship. As I ponder on that statement this morning, it dawns on me that today, I believe that the majority of Christians today live contrary to this. Hallelujah. Oftentimes, we go off track in a lot of ways as Christians. We see this trend in our churches. We give priorities to every other thing but God and his house. Hallelujah. We give priorities to our work. We give priorities to our career. We give priorities to everything. But when it comes to God and his house, uh, we begin to give uh, some good excuses uh, this morning. Today, I believe God wants us to change the narrative and get it right. Can you say amen? What a minister this morning, someone I've entitled, get it right. Out of the book of uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 57 to 62. The Bible says, now it happened as they journeyed on the road that... Someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests. But the son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Verse 59, then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another said also, Lord, I will follow you, but let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Let's pray this morning. Father, by the blood of Jesus Christ, we come before you right now. Lord, we're asking, oh God, uh, that the entrance of your word will bring light and understanding to the simple this morning. Holy Spirit, God, uh, I pray as your word comes forth, uh, let it do what exactly you have ordained it to do this morning, oh God. Uh, may you increase and I decrease in this place. Uh, and I pray let no flesh glory in your presence. In Jesus' name, all God's people shout amen this morning. Get it right. I want to look firstly with you at, uh, you know, setting priorities. This message, uh, you know, bothers around priorities this morning. In life, we all have priorities, whether we are born again or we are not. Hallelujah. We all have priorities, uh, whether we are believers or non-believers. Uh, you know, and our priorities are different from one person to the next. And these priorities determine where we invest our first and best efforts. For some, you know, it might be, you know, their family. You know, others, it might be, you know, their marriage. You know, others, their highest priorities, you know, is their work, their hobby. You know, mentioned this morning, sports team. I see many times when people, you know, are talking about a club, you know, football club. Unfortunately, I was telling a brother yesterday, you know, I said I feel very, very odd. When people are talking about football, you know, my mouth just goes... I mean, I love football, but I'm not really, really into football. You know, I remember one time we were in conference. I was sitting next to Pastor Paul Stephen there, you know, right there, you know, and he leans to me and asks me what, uh, what uh, 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 club am I supporting him? I'm looking, I'm like, no one. 
He looked at me like this and thinking, you know, I look at myself, I look at myself, I, I felt very, very odd. You know, so you look at some people, they're talking about football and you'll see the passion they're putting into it. You know, you see, I mean, some times ago in our church, services going on, uh, you know, and uh, years ago, and, uh, you know, I'm looking, I'm, I'm looking for guys in the church. Where are they? Was later on I heard the playing, uh, you know, tournament, you know, playing a football match somewhere, you know, and uh, I said, okay. And after they finished that football, uh, you know, they came back to church. You know, so other people's uh, priorities might be bothered around, uh, you know, sports team. Each of us has special passion that makes us who we are. Hallelujah. So the word priorities mean something that is prime concern. Something, you know, that is first concern. Most important consideration, you know, matter of greatest importance. In fact, research has it that the word priority came into the English language in the 1400s. And at, since then, I mean, it has stayed singular for the next 500 years. Only in the 1900s uh, did we pluralize the term and start talking about priorities. So you may ask this evening, you know, why is that a problem? Because um, as it's been said, when everything becomes a priority, then nothing is a priority. Hallelujah. And right now, you know, this has never been truer than it is today, you know, in our world. As we find out in our text, you know, priorities can be short term, which includes our daily to do task. The tasks we do at home, the tasks we do at school, the tasks that we do, amen, in our workplace. And other times it can be long time, which involves relationships and activities that make you happy. The things that really matter in life. Listen, church, to succeed in life, you and I have to set priorities. Hallelujah. Priority, we set priorities. Setting priorities is good for decision making tonight and it's good for goal achievement. And with our clear priorities this morning, we can easily become stressed and overwhelmed by the myriad weight of task and responsibility we face on a daily basis. It is for this reason also, you know, that Jethro in the Bible advises Moses in Exodus chapter 18, you know, to delegate, amen, the task, delegate, amen, this task to people, share the responsibility. Moses, set your priorities by letting others handle smaller matters this evening, you know, while you handle or, you know, uh, 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 pay attention to greater ones. Why is that, amen, unless you wear yourself out, make clear priorities this evening. So we set priorities, you know, on good health. We set priorities on money. We set priorities on work. We set priorities on family and relationships, you know, and we set priorities on our physical, our mental and emotional well-being. It's very, very important. These are all good, you know, and necessary tonight. However... It's necessary in certain priorities. Listen very carefully, church. In certain priorities, we must make sure we get our priorities right. Hallelujah. We must make sure we get our priorities right when we're setting our priorities. John Maxwell says this. He says the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, you know, but to schedule your priorities. Hallelujah. Even in schools, we were taught... Amen. The scale of preference. How many of you did economics in school? Hallelujah. We were taught the scale of preference and also, you know, or, you know alternative uh, for gone or, you know, opportunity cost. Hallelujah. How many of you remember those, uh, you know, topics this evening? We were taught, um, you know, these uh, and uh, all this, uh, 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 what's it called? The least um, scale of preference this evening. Um, amen. It's a list of unsatisfied wants arranged in order of priority or importance. You know, you treat or you attend to the most pressing one first before the others that are called the alternative for gone are attended to. Why am I saying this? Listen to me, church. If something is a priority, amen, it is the most important thing that you have to do. It is the most important thing that you have to deal with tonight, amen, before every other thing. Amen, otherwise, you and I stand the risk of having our priorities shifted tonight. Setting priorities. Let's look secondly very quickly. 
the shifted priority or misplaced priority, if you will. So in life, so whilst we get caught up in certain priorities, I mean, we sometimes have inappropriate or misguided focus. We have misguided focus as we are trying to set priorities, you know, in life. We end up with a skewed or wrong order of importance. You know, we mix them up. But whilst we are trying to do this, in our text this morning, we see three men in an offer to follow Jesus. They've decided, I'm going, Master, I'm going to follow you. Verse 30, 57. Now it happened as they journeyed on the road, you know, that someone said to him, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. How many of you know that's a good decision? That's a good decision to make right there. But even as they set this priority to follow Jesus this morning, as they set it to follow Jesus, they began to make excuses of why they can't follow Right there and then. They began to make excuses. You know, I want to follow you. I'm I'm ready to follow you, but let me first go and do this. Let me first go and do that. They began to make different excuses. Started popping up. Amen. Why they can't follow right that moment. And that tells me this evening, this morning, church. Amen. That set our set priorities can be shifted. Hallelujah. Our set priorities, amen, can be misplaced or misguided. Verse 59 to 62 of our text. Then he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. You know, Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow you. But let me first go and bid them farewell who are at my house. But Jesus said to him. No one having put his hand to the plow and looking back his feet for the kingdom of God. Listen, church, despite the fact that one of these excuses, you know, seems legit. Despite the fact that it sounds very, very justifiable this morning, Jesus Christ replied, let the dead bury their own dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But you go and preach the kingdom of God. In other words, uh, you know, you better get your priorities right, buddy. Just like many churches, many church people today. Think about it, church. Uh, The man in our text uh, wanted to interrupt uh, discipleship, uh, you know, to bury his father. Discipleship is ongoing. uh, Amen. And he wanted, uh, you know, to interrupt that. To go bury his father. Jesus says, no, you know, there is no break in discipleship. Hallelujah. There is no break in discipleship, buddy. Amen. Even when you have me, amen, you know, to fulfill a practical obligation. When you leave me tonight and go fulfill all that obligation this evening, you know, your purpose isn't simply that, but to proclaim the kingdom of God. It sounds like Jesus is insensitive here. Hallelujah. I want to go bury my father. You know, just allow me, let me just go and tell my people at home, at least make some preparation, make something, you know, before I follow you. You know, Jesus said no. I mean, he sounds very insensitive, you know, but there is a lesson that Jesus Christ wants them and wants us to learn tonight. Hallelujah. Listen to me, beloved. Following Jesus Christ is not a part-time task. Following Jesus is not a part-time task, church. It's an all-in commitment. Hallelujah. Following Jesus is an all-in commitment. It's going to occupy your time. Following Jesus is going to occupy your thoughts and your resources the big time. I mean, this won't work for someone who says, you know, I'll follow Jesus as soon as I get my life straightened out. I'm going to follow Jesus, you know, but let me get my life straightened out first. This is not going to work. Following Jesus is not going to work for people like that. It's not an option for the person who says, as soon as I finish school, you know, I'm going to be ready. Following Jesus isn't for the person who wants to one day follow Jesus. 
part-time relationship. Hallelujah. Amen. It's an all-in commitment this morning. Jesus said to the man in verse 62, no one having put his hand you know, to the plow and looking back, amen, to go bury his father, amen, and looking back, amen, to go, you know, get involved in family affairs. You know, no one, amen, having put his hand in the plow, amen, that he look, look, and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. One of the major reasons why people, even, even believers in our churches, one of the reasons they shifted their priority is because of convenience. Hallelujah. Oh, this is not convenient for me. I mean, if it's not convenient for me, amen, or my family, then I'm not in. Can I get a witness this morning? If your sermon challenges my immoral and ungodly lifestyle, I'm out of your church. It's inconveniencing. If it's going to challenge my life, my lifestyle, then I'm not going to come to this church. Convenience. I won't come to your church again. When Pastor Jesus was preaching, amen, and was doing miracles and feeding the disciples, you know, I mean, if you know, many people were thronging towards Jesus. But after Jesus, Pastor Jesus stepped his salmon up a little bit, amen, and says, you know, you've got to eat my flesh and drink my blood. How many of you know church began to go down? Church attendance began to go down because it's not convenient. Hallelujah. No wonder even in our churches now, people want to know what is in for them before they answer the call. Pastor, what is in it for me? I had a guy said one time, you know, if you are not ready to get, you know, give me a duplex. I look at the guy, you know, he's living in maybe in a mini flat or, you know, two room, I don't know. You know, until you are ready to give me a duplex and, uh, you know, get a car for me, then I'm not ready to go out. They want to know what is in it for them. They, you know, that is convenience. Hallelujah. Before you answer the call. It's interesting, Pastor Alex spoke this week about convenience. People are mostly concerned about convenience and not minding if God is displeased. As long as, I'm conveni as, long as it's convenient for me. I don't care if God is displeased. I don't care if souls out there die and go to hell. I'm not going to go on outreach, amen, as long, you know, as you provide a vehicle for us to go and we'll be under the shade, under the shade of the vehicle. I don't care what happened to the sinners out there. Hallelujah. Pastor Alex say, said something very powerful. You know, he said that you may get some stuff in your convenience, but it may not be God's best for you. Hallelujah. Is so true today, church. This is why, while some look forward to Christ soon coming, and, you know, have you ever noticed some people are saying, I don't want Jesus to come now because they're living a life of convenience. If Jesus Christ comes right now, this wife I just married, I have not used 50% of my wife. This new car that my husband just bought for me, I've not even cruised it for two weeks. Jesus should hold on first. I'm building my house. I need to finish building that house and live in that house before Jesus comes, if at all. <laughs> you know, people are going through different things in their mind because of convenience. Hallelujah. The pursuit of money has become the bane of our society. I'm talking about a generation, amen, where people, especially believers, are becoming increasingly obsessed with love of money. Encapsulated in materialism and having no regards for Christian values. They claim to love God, but not what God stands for. Are you there, somebody? Their declaration of their love for God doesn't go beyond their lips. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 15 verse 8, uh, you know, these people love me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
I believe there is no generation that this statement is truer than this generation we are in now. Hallelujah. Being a pastor for almost 18 years now, you know, I have, I've had church people make some funny excuses why they can't be in church. Why are you not in church? You know, they make different kind of excuses. You know, I don't have money to come to, to church, pastor. Yet, they have all the money to go to work throughout the week. Can I get a witness tonight? I hear this all the time. And I'm like, God, amen. You have money to go to work Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, even Saturday. Now come to church. You know, your work is about, you know, from 8 to 12 to you know, 10, whatever in the evening, you're there for, you know, hours. Church service is just two hours. On Sunday, come for God's business. You're saying you don't have money. I ask them many times when Fashola asks you to come and see him on Sunday morning that you said you didn't have money. Will you go or you won't go? Conviction. It's all about convenience. Convenience. Hallelujah. Pastor, I'm not feeling well. Pastor, you know, uh, uh, but I, I don't, I'm not this, I'm not that. Amen. So, I mean, what we can what we can try at work. And the excuses we can give our boss at work, we easily take you to church. We turn the church to a dumping site for all kinds of excuses. One man says these words, your priority aren't what you say they are. They are revealed by how you live. Hallelujah. In our text, Jesus said, let the dead bury their dead. Jesus was referring to the spiritually dead here. In other words, amen, let the non-believers take care of the task of this world. While we instead take on the higher mission of proclaiming Christ's kingdom. In this case, the spiritually living, the disciple has more important things to do. Jesus is not against the faithful. He's not against us burying, you know, our dead people. Don't get me wrong. It's not that when your father dies tomorrow, you know, you say, no, I am not going to bury you, you know, because I'm about my father. No, no, that's not what Jesus is saying here. Tonight. Listen to me very carefully, church. You know, he is not saying the faithful should not bury their loved ones. Rather... He wants them to get their priorities right. Hallelujah. He simply wants them to get it right. Johann von Goethe says this word. He says, you know, things which matter most must never be at the mercy of things which matter least. Let me say it again so that it can sink in. It says, things which matter most must never be at the mercy of things which matter least. I can understand, I mean, some people that have to be at work and, you know, unavoidably absent at church. You know, you've tried. Your, I ask people when they say, Pastor, I'm at work on Sunday morning. Amen. I ask them, have you prayerfully gone to your a boss in the office and said, you know, boss, please, would you allow me, you know, allow me to go to church this Sunday? Oh, boss, please, would you allow me to just go to church and I will come back after service? Something like that. Many people that I've asked that said they haven't. You know why? Because their hearts are not there. They haven't. Because if you were to go meet Fashola, you will tell your boss, in fact, you will lie to your boss that you are sick. You are not going to come to work. You will find a way to go there. But to go to church, you know, boss tells you you are working on Sunday and you live it like that. It's my boss. I have to go. Pastor, sorry, I won't be in church. And you are in the, you know, you are in the very, very if, uh, uh, um, uh, sensitive ministry in church. Hallelujah. Things which matter most must never be at the mercy of things which matter least. Hallelujah, church. I can understand there are some unavoidable situations where, I mean, this is unavoidable. You know, you just have to be there. But what I do not understand and what I cannot comprehend, church, amen, is people willingly sacrificing, you know, church service, amen, for birthday parties. 
what I could, what, what I cannot comprehend, amen, is people sacrificing church activities for social function, for football match. Church service is going on. You're going, you're out of the church. You're going to watch football match. That's what I cannot comprehend that church. What I cannot comprehend, beloved, amen. You know, people sacrificing church service to attend family functions. Sunday, Sunday family meeting. Do we have it here? Pastor, our, our family are meeting this Sunday. Hey, <laughs> God. My goodness, preaching for 18 years, I've heard so much, man. Like Pastor Nana said, man, you, you know, things will humble you. Hallelujah. Other people will attend various ceremonies that even do not directly concern them. It's not their father, it's not their mother, it's not their sister, you know, it's not, it's, it's not directly linked to them. It's my friend, you know, it's my friend's sister and sister's, uh, you know, uh, uncle, you know, that died. I want to follow my friend. And you are a pastor's wife. Or you are a pastor in the church. Or you are the head usher. And honestly, I just can't get my head, you know, around that this morning, church. Amen. You know, you, you know, you, you. Can I preach this morning? I'm not talking about new converts here. I'm talking about those who have been saved for decades. People who understand God at least. Hallelujah. Their argument has always been, if I miss church this once, I will not go to hell. If I miss church this once, I will not backslide. Amen. Which is true. You miss church that once, you are not going to go to hell. You will not backslide, but your priority is shifted. Your priority is shifted. Don't come and tell me that God is my priority. Your priority is shifted. Hallelujah. We can't do that with our boss. I mean, I just can't, you know, I cannot help but say that. We can't do all that stuff with our boss at work. Otherwise, our job will suffer it. But it's okay, we, we can do it with God. It's okay if God and the church can get all the trash. It's called misplaced priority. See, misplaced priorities can bring on unnecessary sorrows. Can bring on unfulfillment and regret. However, when we misplace the priority of one who should have our utmost devotion this morning, there are disastrous consequences. Often time, amen, it leads to alienation from God, you know, and sometimes into everlasting torment. It, it sounds very, very simple. It sounds very, very small and minute, uh, but beloved, uh, you know, it carries, uh, you know, amen, disastrous consequences this morning. Jesus' parable of the, full, of the foolish wealthy man in Luke chapter 12, verse 20 is a classic example of this. The man neglected God and spent his life greedily. Accumulating treasure for himself on earth. Then he died with no opportunity to enjoy his goods. But worse than that, he died with a bankrupt soul. Think about it. He did not enjoy his goods. And he died with bankrupt soul. We are a generation that doesn't see commitment as priority. As believers, we have forgotten that we are in this world and not of this world. Can I get an amen? amen. Conformity to the world has become the trend in the Christendom today. And that's why we need the transforming power of the Holy Ghost to renew and reset our mind. Can somebody say amen? We need the transforming power of the Holy Ghost. Romans chapter 12 verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I want to close by looking at the surpassing priority. Hallelujah. 
or surrendered priority. Amen. See, as much as we know that other things that I mentioned are equally as important, our text shows us that prioritizing our relationship with God matters the most. Hallelujah. Those other things I mentioned, they are equally, they are, they are important. They are good. They are not evil. But our text here, you know, want us to catch that revelation of the importance, uh, amen, you know, of taking God uh, as our priority. Our relationship with God, Jesus Christ, uh, is the life. Uh, and outside of him this morning, uh, everything represents spiritual death. So you cannot put anything before him tonight. Mark Twain says this word, to change your life, uh, you need to change your priorities. Tell somebody, change your priority. If you want to change life, beloved, you need to change, you know, your priorities. We need to change our priorities by making God our priority this morning. This is the part people struggle with the most. In Psalm 92, the psalmist, amen, affirms humanity's ultimate priority with an earnest call to worship our creator. Hallelujah. Psalm 29 verse 2, you know, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Listen to me, beloved. Amen. That is our supreme duty for time and eternity. That is our supreme duty. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Listen, when you are trying to shift your priority, you know, from church, from God, you know, to self, are you giving God the honor or are you giving self the honor? That text says, give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Are you glorifying God by disobeying him? Are you glorifying God by ignoring his, wall, his house and his work? Are you glorifying him this morning? To honor and adore and delight in, glorify and enjoy God above all his creation. As he is worthy to be worshipped. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. This verse emphasizes the importance of aligning our priorities with God. Hallelujah. Our priorities. This is my priority. Sir. I want to align it with God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. It's easy to get lost in the flood of gold, so many goals of the do's, you know, and don'ts that we have. And just the business of life, so much so that we lose track of our priority this morning. But God has made, amen, amen. God has made that the main thing, the main thing this morning. We can easily get lost. He's made the main thing, the main thing this morning, church. You're going to find, when you get this right, church, listen to me, when you get this right, the other priorities of your life, uh, you know, tend to line themselves up in their proper order. Hallelujah. You need to get this right first. That text, that scripture, you need to read it, you know, and put pressure on that scripture, you know, seek you first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And every other thing, every other thing will be added to you. Listen, our Heavenly Father knows that we need the job we're looking for. Hallelujah. You're busy looking for a job. You know, that's why you're not coming. You know, he knows you need that job. He knows, amen, you need that resources. You need that money this morning. I mean, he knows you need that contact, amen, that contact and connection for that contract you're looking for. He knows you need them. He knows you need that business. He knows you need that rest. Whatever we may have chosen as a priorities, church, he knows we need them. And he's not objecting to it. All our God is saying, church, to you is make me your number one priority. Hallelujah. The most important thing you can do is to build, to maintain, and prioritize your relationship with God. What do you do when your family or social function coincides with your church function? What do you do? 
who gets the priority. This has been a subject of debate many times. You know, when Arsenal and Liverpool final match is on, amen, a church, you know, is on during church service, amen, who gets the priority? I don't even know the reigning um, uh, football. So just take anyone I see, you know, Liverpool or whatever, and you know, I don't know. But who gets the priority? I don't know about you. If my family function coincides with my church event, what I'll simply do is to simply request for time and date adjustment. Please, can you adjust the date so much so that it does not coincide, you know, with my, you know, church activities. I'm not saying this because I'm a pastor. I'm saying this because I'm a Christian. Hallelujah. Can you make an adjustment for that time to be able, amen, for me to be able to come? Or will you humbly ask um, me to be excused? Or simply ask to be excused. This is not because I'm a pastor, but because I'm a It depends on where your priorities lie, church. Do I love my family? Yes, I do. Do I love God? Yes, I do. But I've got to set my priorities right. A few years ago, Pastor Glenn scheduled a revival for our church in Antony with Pastor Phil Azil and the team that came with him. And the date coincided with the date I'm um, to write my uh, professional exam that I write every year. I had to make a choice. I had to make a, I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision, but to call the long story short, amen, I deferred that particular exam for that year to have that revival. Until today, I never regretted taking that decision. That particular exam, I've done it, I've passed it. Think about it, church. It's all about what and who we consider the greatest priority. I close with the story of Ian Gray. This is what he says. Ian Gray spent his whole life searching for the one trait that makes people successful. He wrote an essay that's been read over and over again called The Common Denominator for so of Success. In it, he revealed that the chief characteristics for success, success in life is not hard work, it's not good luck, and it's not astute human relationship. Although these are important, the one factor that seems to transcend all the rest is the habit of putting the first thing first. In other words, it's having the right priorities. Let me ask you this morning, conference body, what do you consider as the greatest priority? What do you consider as your greatest priority this morning, church? For the world, all these things are good and important. But for us as believers, the most important thing, you know, our greatest priority, hallelujah. Our greatest priority is God himself. Our greatest priority is God. Amen. It has to be God. We often use the phrase many times, being God-centered. Do you know what that means? Being in God, you know, being God-centered, you know, it simply means putting God first and allowing every other thing, every other activities in our lives to flow from that center. In other words, his priorities are to be our priorities. Hallelujah, somebody. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Hallelujah. We know that, you know, that is the picture of the good shepherd, you know, and true shepherd. Amen. But the question is, if Christ is your true shepherd, you know, are we true as his, as his sheep? If Christ is our true shepherd, are we true as his true sheep? This, are we true as his sheep this morning? Because if we are, hearing his voice will be our major priorities. Woman says responding to God's demands ought to be our first priority and not our last resort. God has every right, beloved, to demand from us at any time anything he wants, regardless of how big and how often they come. Colossians chapter 3 verse 2, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Hallelujah. Paul's purpose in writing this book of Colossians, amen, is to show that Jesus Christ is preeminent. He is first and foremost in everything that we do. And our Christian life, the Christian life should reflect that priority as well. Can you say amen? Beloved, amen. God wants us 
to backtrack this morning. Hallelujah. He wants us to backtrack to the place where he wants uh, where this evening, uh, you know, with him so we can meet him there again. We can backtrack and meet him, you know, where he wants, where, amen, pastors and pastor's wife in this place, uh, congregation, church members, uh, amen, conference is coming to an end tonight uh, as we journey back to our cities, uh, amen. Uh, you know, I want to encourage you this, mon this morning, uh, perhaps uh, you've gotten your priorities right, uh, wrong rather, you've gotten it wrong, uh, amen, as we are concluding our conference uh, and going back to our cities, uh, amen. Uh, my prayer this morning is that God will open open our eyes uh, amen, to recognize our state and move us to cry to him for restoration so we can get it right again. Can you say amen? amen. That's all I have for you this morning. God bless you. Praise God. Amen. We want to uh, dismiss this morning, uh, sorry, take a break uh, for a few minutes. Uh, we will be back by uh, uh, 10 minutes to 11, and so we're going to have uh, a short break. I want to encourage you to please uh, use the exit at the back there to go get your uh, snacks. Also, uh, these following pastors uh, are expected to be with Pastor Glenn and Pastor Paul Stephen in the office, Pastor Bitwell, Pastor Charles, Pastor Paul, Pastor Nana, Pastor Tayo, Pastor Lacon, Pastor Victor, and Pastor John. The rest of the pastors, you could use the other uh, admin office up in the gallery there. Amen. Let's pray this morning for the meal, uh, the snack. Father, we thank you this morning for all that you have done and spoken to us about. Bless the uh, meal in Jesus' name we pray.